Amen. If you, amen. If you have your copy of the Word of God today, open it up to Mark chapter 14. I'm excited to see the return of the missions banquet. Uh, we've had about three years, really since COVID, that we've not met and celebrated missions and focused our hearts to the harvest fields of the world where God is unfolding His plan to redeem the, Himself, a people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And I'm thankful for the history and heritage of this church that is given to missions. Uh, we have a young man that has been uh, sent out from this church. He and his wife are, have been in Papua New Guinea for a few days, and they, I believe, will be coming stateside, but they are heading into full term uh, aviation, missions aviation. Many of you know Frankie Ruscio. And so I just want to just encourage you, if you have availability Saturday to be in this room at 5 p.m. and to eat some food with us, make plans to join in. It is a wonderful, wonderful time of celebration for the church. Uh, We were looking at the stats. Really, this last summer, more than 10% of this room's Sunday morning attendance was overseas over the summer, 10%. That is, that's, a, that's something to praise the Lord for, that the Lord has raised up so many to go, amen, and to, to do things, so amen. And so I'm excited for that meal. Another feast that we keep having is we've been doing the Tuesday morning Bible study. Many of you are not able to be a part of that because of work schedules, and so all of those studies are being thrown onto the YouTube channel, and there's a podcast available where you can follow along with the study in the book of Philippians. You are available on Tuesdays at 11 a.m., Uh, You can call the number or log in online and be a part of that study as we work verse by verse through Philippians. We welcome you to be a part of it. And so as we look into Mark 14, I want to ask you a question. Uh, What is the greatest and most important meal you've ever had in your life? What is the greatest and maybe most important meal you've ever had? What would you answer? If I had to ask you the question, like, what's your favorite meal? That would be easy for many of you. Uh, Some of you would mention a steakhouse in Orlando or maybe some Mexican restaurant or possibly seafood, and for me it's obviously barbecue. I'm a big barbecue fan. And so uh, I remember, though, there was a meal last year. Jenny and I were given some gift certificates to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. We had never been to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. As we went and and had that food, every bite I took of everything they had was like a 10 out of 10. Like it really was. I was just like, okay, I can see the hype. The hype lived up, you know. It was really good stuff. How many of you have ever been to Krispy Kreme when they have the hot and and ready donuts right off the conveyor belt? It shoots you up into like third heaven when you bite into that that donut. It's like a religious experience. And so I was researching, though, for Americans, what's the most historic, important meal for Americans? No doubt Thanksgiving is the meal. If anyone had to invade our country, just show up Thursday afternoon, Thanksgiving, maybe Friday when all the tryptophan from the turkey is set in. And that would be the time to invade America, not giving hints, but just saying we're no good on that day. It's usually about football and turkey. But uh, the first Thanksgiving was important for us as Americans. That's where everyone survived and they were able, the Puritans were able to have this wonderful crop in the summer and the pilgrims celebrated with a Thanksgiving feast. For America, I think it was awesome to see when Buzz Aldrin and Lance Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, not Lance Armstrong, Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. They had their first meal on the moon, and I I have here their menu. They ate some bacon squares, sugar cookie cubes. They had peaches, coffee, and a pineapple grapefruit drink, and that's pretty cool for our nation to send people to the moon, and there they are eating on the moon. It's just pretty cool. There are people in our city that every year will recreate the Titanic final meal, and if you've ever studied the Titanic meal, the, the final meal they had on the Titanic before it sank that night, the first-class passengers ate a 10-course meal. 10-course meal. You can look up everything they had to eat, but part of it, they had some filet mignon, they had oysters, they had lamb, duckling, and this was a delicacy for them. They had celery was a delicacy. Celery is not a delicacy for me, so just letting you know, don't bring me celery. I'll throw it away or feed it to the chickens. All right. As we open our Bibles today, though, we're looking at what I believe to be the most famous and important meal in all of history. And it's the last meal Christ had with his disciples before he goes to the cross. The Last Supper. And many of us have seen the, the painting, the, the famous painting of Da Vinci, where, you know, there they are all on that side of the table. It's like Jesus says, hey, everyone come on this side, we're going to take a, a photo, you know, and, and everyone gets there. And you see that this is the grand portrayal from the Gospel of Mark of Jesus 
at his last meal with his disciples. He is merely hours now away from the cross. And so for the reading of the Word of God, let me invite you to stand for God's Word. I'm going to read, in, starting in verse 10, we'll talk a moment about Judas, and then I'll read through uh, to verse 25. And God's Word reads as follows, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they, they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reading or reclining at the table, at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, One of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful. They said to him after one another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Verse 22, and as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. God's given us his word. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you've not left us without revelation. But you have spoken and have given us your fully inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. I pray, Father, you would bless us to submit under its full authority. And as we see and study today what is written in it, help us to apply its truths to our lives and to live by its principles. I pray, ultimately, Father, you would mold us into the image of Christ. As we're told in Ephesians 1, we have been predestined to be formed into the image of Christ. So bless us today to to grow more in Christ's likeness. And may we delight in holiness and hate sin by your grace. Help us along as we grow in Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. And so I've already set for you the context of the final meal. Everyone knows the context of this meal. He's going to go out from this meal, he's going to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then as he leaves the Garden, he will be arrested. And he will start going on trial, and that begins to unfold here in Mark chapter 14. We see this meal he's having, it's the Passover meal with his disciples. There's so much that we can glean from these verses, and as I began the passage here in verse 10 about Judas Iscariot, Mark tells us before he gets into the Passover meal who the betrayer is and names him. And, and makes it clear, Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order but to betray him to them. And so Mark gives us the betrayer right before. The other gospel writers will reveal the betrayer right during the meal. And so we see this happening uh, in Mark a, a little differently than the other gospels. He's giving us a heads up before we have this grand meal together. And as we step into the meal starting in verse 12, the beginning of it, we see some things unfolding that I believe are very applicable for us to understand about the the deity of Christ, the doctrine that we know of Jesus from the Word of God. The first point today, as we see Jesus partaking in the final meal with His disciples, the first point, see the sovereignty of Christ over the Passover. We see the sovereignty of Christ over this meal. They ask Him, where are we going to have this meal? Where are we going to go and prepare the meal And he he, he calls over two of his disciples and says, listen, go into the city. You're going to find a man carrying a jar of water. He'll meet you. Follow him. 
he'll lead you to this other guy and then ask the other guy, hey, where's this room where my teacher can come and have his, have his Passover meal with his disciples? The way Jesus is sharing all of this, it's not so much that Jesus went ahead and prepared it beforehand. It's He is sovereign over all these things. There is so much playing into this. When you see a man carrying a jar of water, meeting you as soon as they get into the city, Christ is sovereignly unfolding the plan that, that is at play, that he is fulfilling all of the steps necessary heading up to the cross. These instructions imply a supernatural preparation for the final meal. And that's something that Mark has been showing us again and again and again as we study his gospel. Some of the examples you've seen already is he's told them three times, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die and I'm going to be handed over and I will rise again. We saw it earlier in Mark 11 when he had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem He told some disciples, go into a city, you'll find some people and some colt, a colt tied to, you know, a donkey and a tree and all this. And he he just spells it all out and it all comes to pass exactly as Jesus described it. This one's a bit strange because they go into town and there's a man carrying a jug of water. In that culture, it was usually the females that would carry the jugs of water around. And so there's a man carrying a jug of water around. I can't imagine Jesus would have prepared this beforehand and said, hey... Uh, I want you to just stand out near the front of the village holding a jug of water for a couple of days. And as you're doing that, some disciples eventually will come along. Do you see the supernatural sovereignty of Jesus who knows how events will unfold? Saying to his disciples, go, and this is all going to work out exactly as I tell you it's going to work out. And that's exactly what we find in verse 16. His disciples set out, they went to the city, and they found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And so we see this, and we see it even in this chapter, more of Jesus telling the future when he's about to tell Peter of his denial. Peter, you will deny me. All of you disciples, you will deny me. It's different than a betrayal. A denial is, we don't know him. I don't know what you're talking about. We don't know him. And Peter, you're going to do it. He said, I won't deny you. We're going to look at that next week, the foretelling of Peter's denial. We will study that together next week, but... As we look back, we see in our lives as Christians, all things happen for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. There are these events in our lives that God ordains, that He predestines, that we fall into them. Ephesians 2.10 is a great verse for this. For you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has beforehand ordained that you should walk in them. He has ordained for us to do these things to glorify Him. And those events happen as we walk through our lives and we follow Jesus. It's amazing to see His providence unfolding for us and His sovereign hand unfolding for us. There are so many moments you've had, we call them divine appointments. Divine appointments. There are moments in our life where He sits us next to people that might need encouragement or need a gospel witness. And we are the chosen vessels of God for that moment where we sense the Holy Spirit working on our hearts saying, have a conversation, speak up, encourage this person, share the gospel with this person. And we fulfill those ordained moments of God. Those are things I pray for daily and look for every time I I head out. I'm like, Lord, whatever you have ordained for this day, may I fulfill it. May I step into those works you prepared. There are these icebergs off the coast of Greenland, another Titanic reference here. In the frigid waters around Greenland, there are countless icebergs. Some of them are very small, and some of them are massive, large, gigantic icebergs. If you pay attention to them carefully, you're going to notice that the smaller ice flows will go in a very different direction, while the massive icebergs flow in another direction. And people have studied this. Why do the big ones go one way and the the small ones go another direction? Shouldn't they all go the same way? And the explanation is very simple. It's the surface winds on the ocean that drive along the little icebergs that are out there, whereas the huge masses of ice are carried along by the deep ocean currents. And when we face trials and we go through the tragedies of our lives and we go through these hardships, it's helpful to see our lives as being subject to these two forces we encounter as believers in Jesus Christ. We have the surface winds and the ocean currents of God's plans unfolding for each of us. The winds represent perhaps everything changeable, unpredictable, distressing unto us. Things that would array themselves against us. But operating simultaneously with these great gusts and gales and storms even. There is another force that's even more powerful that's moving us along. And that force is the movement of God's wise and sovereign purposes. His providential unfolding hand. 
the, the deep flow of his unchanging love propelling us through his plans. Where there is that truth of Philippians 1 6 that we studied this week together. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Church, listen, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. If he started his faith in you and you detect, I am believing on Christ, he's going to see it through. You can take it to the bank. He will persevere you through to completion. And praise God, he will. Even though I struggle with sin daily, and you struggle with sin daily, Christ is going to see us through. And praise God, he will. As he partakes in this final meal with his disciples, we see his sovereignty over the Passover and over all things. The second thing we see, and this is the second point today, you want to search out your personal commitment to Jesus. As he's observing this Passover meal, search out your personal commitment to Jesus. When you get into verse 17, and he starts going through this, it's evening, he comes with the twelve, as they were reclining at table and eating. Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, the one who is eating with me. Can you imagine this? They've been with him three years. Why do we know that Jesus' ministry was three years? It all comes down to the Passover meals. And it all comes down to the Gospel of John who mentions three separate Passover meal occurrences with Jesus. That's the only way we know historically there were three years that these disciples had with Christ. This is the final Passover meal they're having with Jesus. And they've been with him three years. That's quite a good journey. And they sit down with him and he says, one of you is going to betray me. And what was their reaction? It says it. They, became, they, they began to be sorrowful and say to him one after another, Is it I? In my mind, I imagine them just going down the table and looking at each other. Is it me? Is it, is, am I going to betray you? Is it me? Is it I? Is it I? And what's fascinating about this passage, the timing in which Mark wrote this gospel of, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the churches, the church was going under one of the first persecutions of Rome. And so many of the readers, the first readers of Mark's gospel were suffering persecution. And there was a great temptation under persecution to deny Jesus. To to say, I don't know him. I don't know him because Christians were being killed and murdered and martyred during the time and the publishing of Mark's gospel to the churches. And so they had to read this part of this gospel with such fascination. And, And to be mindful of it, could I betray Jesus? Could I deny Jesus Christ? It's a question that we should each ask of ourselves. And this is written in a way, when you read it every time in each of the Gospels, it's as if it comes off the page to each of us where we think, well, what what would I do if I were in those situations? What what would I do if Christ were taken away and and I didn't know the full story and and I knew enough, but I didn't know enough, and and man, they're after me. And and do you know him? You were one of his followers, weren't you? you? You've been around Jesus. Would I do what Peter did? Would I deny him? Would I curse and deny him? Would I, I would like to say, yeah, we, we would all like to, with hindsight, say, oh, no, I wouldn't be one of those who would deny Christ. But I'm afraid on that night, with all of the pressures at play, all of us, all of us would have fallen that night, knowing what those disciples knew and being in the situations they were in. But their examples have been written down to encourage and to strengthen us because we know the fuller story of the resurrection and everything that comes afterwards. And Jesus gives them some evidence. He says, it's one of the twelve. So that narrows it down. There may have been a few others in that room. And he says, it's one of the twelve who is dipping bread into the dish with me. And so Peter was the one sitting near Christ. John was sitting near Christ as we look at the other Gospels. Uh, we, we know from the other Gospels there was some evidence that some of them were aware it's possibly Judas Iscariot before it even happened. But but we're not sure. Verse 21, for the Son of Man goes as it is written. It was written of the Son of Man that he would would die and suffer for sinners. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is, is betrayed. Jesus himself says of Judas Iscariot, it would have been better for that man if he had not been born. You know, I've had people over the years ask me about Judas. Do you think Judas will be in heaven? Because he was sorry, right? He was sorry for what he did. He was sorrowful. After he was caught in it, Jesus says very clearly in John 17, Judas is lost. He says to the Father, I didn't lose any of the ones you gave unto me except for one, the son of perdition. He's speaking of Judas Iscariot. And so let me give you on the account of Christ himself, Judas will not be in heaven. Because Jesus Christ tells us Judas Iscariot will not be in heaven. The Bible tells us there are two types of sorrow we can encounter in this world. There's a worldly repentance 
And there's a godly repentance. Uh, Corinthians tells us there's a worldly repentance that leads to death. Guess what Judas did when he was sorrowful? He went out and hung himself. That was a worldly repentance. He was sad for what he had done, but he was not sad before God. And he did not repent and turn from his sin. There's a sorrow that leads to eternal life, and it's a godly repentance. Where you are sad for your sin, and you, in brokenness, bring that sin before the Lord, and confess those sins, and repent, and turn from them. That is a repentance that will give you life. And so, make no mistake, so much of what we see on television when politicians get caught, and maybe they claim to be a Christian or whatever, it's worldly repentance. The reality of worldly repentance is if you could orchestrate events in such a way that you could be back in your sin, and no one would know about it, you would do it. Or godly repentance would say, there's no way in the world I will go back to that again and feel what I feel right now. I will not do it. I, I can't do that. And so this is something where we search out our personal commitment to Jesus Christ. It's startling that every disciple is eventually told in just a few verses after this passage that they will all fall away from Jesus on this night. Judas Iscariot would betray Jesus, but all of his disciples would deny him on this night. As we see that this passage was written during the persecution, the question every Christian has to ask themselves is, under what pressures might I be tempted to betray Jesus or deny Jesus Christ? Could I deny him? Knowing what I know of him now, could I do it? And this is a historical question for Christians, a real question being asked by Christians all over the world today, and being answered very differently in the American culture than it is in India. And when I visited yesterday with the Pakistani funeral and heard some of their stories of persecution and different reports coming out of Pakistan, it's a different world. They were talking about a cricket player that had to deny Christ to just play cricket, and he converted to Islam. And just what a, a sad shame that was for the Pakistani cricket team to see that happen over the years, for someone that was a believer in Jesus to deny Jesus and convert to Islam just to play a game. What would it take for you to deny Christ, and could you deny Christ? History is full of the blood of martyrs who have said, under no circumstances, Christ is my Lord, I've seen too much. I would die rather than deny my Lord. And it's my hope and prayer that I would have that same conviction. Were it ever to come to that, if I were to face death, I would stand and and die for Christ. It's my hope and prayer I would, and I would not deny Him. He's been so good all these years, why would I deny Him? And it's my hope and prayer. We are seeing in American culture people denying and giving up Jesus Christ for far lesser things than our brothers and sisters in the world are giving up. In the world, if if you deny Christ in certain lands, you can keep your house, you can keep your job, you can keep your marriage, you can keep your business. In America, you lose a bit of popularity and credibility if you stand firm for Jesus Christ. There are certain things you probably can't do anymore if you're an outspoken Christian and follower of Jesus. There are many things you can, but it's getting a bit tougher in our nation and a bit more uh, on the edges if you're someone that's committed and following Christ. But yet we're seeing a great falling away of the church, of people, just over the cultural pressures alone, saying, I'd rather bow to the culture than bow my knee to Jesus as the Lord of my life. As much as I've been raised with Jesus, I no longer identify as a Christian and a follower of Jesus anymore. What a shame that is. What a shame that is, because Christ... Again, went to that cross fully for the sinner. What is it for us to to follow him? In John 6, verse 66, God's word says this. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. This was after he told people, look, if you want to be my follower, you've got to drink my blood and eat my flesh. No doubt that's a bit odd, right, to, to any hearer. But we understand it as Christians now what he was saying and meaning. The audience he was speaking to was like, this man's a madman. He's crazy. People were just leaving the room, saying, I'm done. I don't want to follow that. And so Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Those I observe that have left the faith, I don't see them in any great place of security and joy. I see them in a great place of confusion, and I'm, I pity them. To, to walk away from the, the giver of life, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father except through Jesus. And to walk with them for those many years and just walk away. Uh, there's a, a man that on YouTube who left the faith basically said, My family now, we do feel like we're out in the ocean. We, we, we're just a bit lost. We're not sure what to do with ourselves after they had betrayed Christ and left the church. 
And I just thought that's exactly the feeling you should feel when you depart and step away from Jesus, the feeling of lostness. As Jesus partakes in the final meal with his disciples, you see the sovereignty of Christ over the Passover. You search out your personal commitment to Jesus. The third and final thing that will take quite a bit of our time is you want to study the meaning of the Passover as fulfilled in Christ. You want to study the meaning of the Passover as fulfilled in Christ. None of you that I'm aware of, maybe a few of you were raised in a Jewish household. And I won't ask you to raise your hands. Uh, We do have a few that were raised Jewish in the room. And if you were, and if it was an Orthodox Jewish household, you no doubt observed the Passover meal. You observed Passover. As Christians, we have the Lord's Supper, which is a carryover from the Passover meal. It's unleavened bread with wine or grape juice. People ask, and they've asked me this all the time, David, why don't we use wine in our church? Why don't we use wine? Did you know this? Southern Baptists used wine in the, the Lord's Supper. Southern Baptists did, all the way up till about the 1920s. And you may ask, well, why did it change? What happened? What happened was Southern Baptists kept dealing with the, the blue-collar family in a way where the alcoholism of our nation was affecting the families in our Baptist churches at an alarming rate. There was destruction happening in the homes through alcohol where it was your Baptist pastors that began to lead the charge in this nation uh, to do away with alcohol and to to have that that, uh, amendment added to the Bill of Rights uh, where they were able to do away with it for a season. And it was a Southern Baptist that started, uh, you know, Welch's Grape Juice. It was a Baptist pastor, Eli Crow, that that came up with the idea of Welch's Grape Juice. Or it was Edward Welch and then it was a few others that worked on it. Anyways, one of the greatest wine sellers in the South was John Broadus. He was one of the uh, leading pastors in the nation as a Southern Baptist. So things changed. Our Presbyterian brothers could hold their drink a little better, and they were more white-collar. And so to this day, they still hold uh, wine in their Eucharist. There are some Southern Baptist churches that have opened it up and allowed uh, grape juice and wine just to be a bit more biblical. But I'm just letting you know a bit of our history. People have asked, why don't you use wine? That's our story. And grape juice is not bad, so, uh, you know, to, to help those that might be struggling. But here's the thing I want to get to. What do we do with the Passover? Of all the Jewish festivals, the Passover was the greatest festival of the year for the Jewish family. It's where the Jewish family would gather together, and they would think through that night. Uh, you, know, you remember the story of the ten plagues in Egypt. The final plague in Egypt was the angel of death was going to pass over all of Egypt. And for those who observed the Passover meal and took a a lamb and killed it and put the blood on the doorposts, the angel of death would pass over that home and the firstborn in that home would not die. That's the Passover meal. Some of you have seen the Prince of Egypt. And you've seen that awesome scene with that smoky cloud just going through and just, you know, sucking the life out of everyone. It's really, really an awesome cartoon. If you've never seen it, I actually commend it. I love that cartoon. It's really good. And so the Passover meal was instituted afterwards to remember that night. It comes out of Exodus 12, verses 3 through 8. If you have your Bibles, you may want to turn there for a moment. Exodus 12, 3 through 8. And this is the observance after the event where Moses tells all of Israel to do this, or this may be during the event. I'm sorry. He says this in verse 3. Tell all the congregation of Israel... That on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their fathers. This is the first one, of course. A lamb for the household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each of you can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. When the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight, then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. And so the Passover was a feast designated and designed to commemorate the night God passed over Egypt when the death angel destroyed the firstborn of Egypt. And it was the last of the ten plagues that God sent to judge Egypt. The, fast, uh, the, the Passover is also called the Feast of Unleavened Bread because they ate uh, bread without leaven or yeast in it. No yeast or leavened bread was to be used and, and kept in the house during the days of that fast and feast. The regulations for the Passover are found in all throughout Exodus 12. 
We've just read some of it, so let me go over some of the highlights here. They were to choose a lamb, which was to be killed on the evening of the Passover. They were to take the blood of that lamb and put some on the doorpost of their homes, just as we read. They were to roast the lamb over a fire and eat it with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. They were to eat this meal dressed for a journey with their shoes on, which I usually eat with my shoes on. Maybe you don't. They were to have walking sticks in their hands, and they were to eat it as though they were in a hurry. It was after the Passover that they left Egypt and went out into the wilderness. And the, the order of the meal is as follows. They drank a cup of red wine mixed with water. There was a ceremonial washing of hands, which symbolized their need for spiritual and moral cleansing. They ate the bitter herbs, which symbolized their bondage in Egypt. Then they would drink a second cup of wine, at which time the head of the household explained the meaning of the Passover to the family. Then they would sing a hymn together. Out of Psalms 113 and 114, they would sing the first two of those psalms together. And this is how Orthodox Jewish families have observed it uh, for thousands of years now. After they sing, the lamb is brought out. The head of the household distributes pieces of it with the unleavened bread. The unleavened bread symbolized haste and speed. There was no time to allow the dough to rise before the journey was going to begin. And then they would drink a third cup of wine. And after eating their meal, they would conclude the meal by singing the rest of the Halal Psalms, which are Psalm 115 through 118. This was the meal the disciples were talking about in this passage. And there's so much symbolism in this meal that points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of those things that Orthodox Jews today miss, the symbolism that points to Jesus. But let's talk about some of that uh, imagery. The first one is the feast involved a lamb. Uh, They were to choose a lamb. This could have been any lamb. Uh, It was to be spotless, but at least it was to be a lamb. It refers to uh, your lamb in verse 5 of Exodus 12 meaning that it was a lamb the kids and the family would know well. And I don't know about you, but uh, having some farm animals around, I, I don't, I'm not too keen on taking one of them and killing them. Uh, they're so darn cute. We have five chickens now that wake me up every morning, and I look out and I see these chickens. And darn it, if they haven't grown in my heart, I, lo- I have a heart for chickens now when I see chickens. They're too darn cute to kill and eat them, but, uh, but I'll still go to Chick-fil-A, right? I don't know. I'm a hypocrite. This was a lamb the family knew where there was a personal lamb that they would take and they would, they would uh, kill the lamb. This was intentional. God wanted them to see the high cost of their own sin. He wanted them to understand that salvation is a very personal business. So it would be a lamb that they knew. Jesus Christ is not just one Savior among many. He's the Savior. And the question you have to ask is, can you personally say today, Jesus is your Savior? He's become personal to you and trust you've trusted him as your Savior. Of course, the biggest connection to Christ is the Lamb was to be without blemish, spotless. This is a picture of the perfection and purity. And this Lamb speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ because He also is without sin and without blemish. He's the sinless Savior and the perfect sacrifice for you and for me on the cross. The Lamb was to be slain and its blood was to be applied to the doorpost of the house. The family was together inside the house and eat the meal together. And when the death angel pass through the land to kill all of the firstborn children, those who were in the homes with the blood on the doorposts would be safe. I don't know of a stronger picture of the blood of Jesus Christ on a person's life than that. This is a picture of Jesus Christ. The only shelter anyone has against the wrath of Almighty God is the shed blood of Jesus Christ on that cross. It is the perfect shelter against the wrath of God. If you ever have any hope to be saved, you must Come to Jesus Christ by faith, and when you do, the Bible tells us the blood of Jesus Christ washes away every sin and is applied to your hearts and lives. And, and so what's beautiful about it, there's Romans 8, 1, there's now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no judgment that will fall on you anymore because all of the judgment from God towards sin fell on Christ for you and on your behalf. He died as your substitute in your place on that cross. A judgment death that you deserve to die and I deserve to die. And his blood is the only shield against the wrath and judgment of God. We see that the lamb was to be roasted with fire. Throughout scripture, fire is a picture of judgment. And it reminded Israel that the judgment of God was being poured out on sinful Egypt. And the only thing that prevented Israel from being judged along with Egypt was the blood of that lamb that had just died to save that home. This lamb had been judged in their place. And died as a substitute for the firstborn in that home. 
And this picture is the Lord Jesus Christ who was judged in our place and he was judged in the place of redeemed ones. You know, where, where um, he was taking the firstborn of Egypt, God in his love, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The lamb had to be eaten. Uh, they had to portion out the lamb before they killed it to know, is this lamb going to feed everybody? Do we need to maybe have another lamb for our neighbors? Or what do we have to do? It was no good just to kill the lamb. The lamb had to be appropriated by the individual. Every individual at the Passover meal had to receive that lamb into their own bodies and and digest it. We have to individually receive Christ into our lives. John 1, verse 12, as many as received him, Jesus, is to them God gives the right to become his children. I had people ask me that years ago. Why isn't what Christ did on the cross just automatic for everyone? Everyone goes to heaven. Isn't God going to be more glorified when everyone goes to heaven? The Bible says it clearly. You must individually receive Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. And so have you done that? Have you received Christ as your Savior and Lord? And I want to finish out my sermon with the two meals being offered. And this is my conclusion here. There are two meals really in this passage. You have the Passover meal. And then look with me at verse 22. And as they were eating, he took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. Jesus is appropriating the Passover and fulfilling the Passover in their very view and saying, this is me. This, this bread represents my body. Take and eat it. This cup, this cup represents my blood. This is my blood. He, he took a cup, verse 22. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. A covenant is a promise from God. It's a promise from God. The covenant is God will not condemn anyone who receives his son. He will not condemn anyone. All who come under the son will be saved, which is poured out for many. Verse 24 is so fascinating. Did Christ die for the sins of the world? Yes. Did he die for the church? Yes. There are various ways in which the Bible speaks of the sacrifice of Christ. It is acceptable where anyone who will repent and believe can be saved and will be saved, but it is particular to the church and those who will believe. It was poured out for many. For the believers, for the Christians. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So there are two meals being referenced. He just is finishing the Passover meal with his disciples and he says, I'm not going to be lifting this cup to drink it again until until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. I want you to turn in your Bibles, and this is where we'll land the airplane of the sermon. Revelation 19, verse 6. Jesus is speaking about a meal to come, a meal coming in the future. And when we read the book of Revelation and see how everything ends out, we see the final meal that Jesus is speaking about in Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 6. This is John writing. He says, And I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me these words, these are the true words of God. The the gathering up of this cup where Jesus will lift it one day and drink it anew is the marriage supper of the Lamb where every redeemed person of God from all of history, the the Israelites from the Old Testament and the church and Christians of the New Testament beyond are all joined together in one final meal, one, one inaugural meal. It's the inaugural meal into glory. We're going to be there. I can't wait. I, I think it's going to be exciting. There will be north of maybe one to two billion or more people there. We'll be We'll be sitting around. I, I just imagine everyone's dish will have what they love the best. I don't know how that will work. It may be maybe the Passover meal. Who knows? But I, in my mind, I imagine some like barbecued brisket there with uh, sweet tea ready to roll. I imagine we'll be there with all of the folks we've been reading about in Scripture. And they'll probably have sections, you know, like the John the Baptist section and the Moses section and all these sections. And we're just going to be hanging out, having the grandest meal with all of the redeemed for the first time in all of history. And Christ will come into the room, he'll take his seat, 
Or maybe he'll stand and he will fulfill this verse where he grabs the, the, the drink and lifts it. And we're all going to grab and drink with him. And it's going to be the consummation of the age and the, the inaugural of all of glory and all of heaven for the, all of the redeemed of church and, and of history. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There are two meals being spoken of in this verse, in this passage. Uh, I, none of us in this room were at this first meal. None of us were. Uh, I mean, Sig, nephew, you might have been there. Where are you at, Sig? Just kidding around. <laughs> Just kidding around. That was low. I'm sorry, Sig. I love you. One meal has already happened. The other meal is coming. Everyone in this room, including Sig, nephew, missed the first meal. Including Sig, nephew. I'm praying, though, that everyone in this room, everyone that hears this message, that we will all make it to the second meal being referenced in this verse. I look forward to it. I can't wait to join a billion plus people for a wedding feast. I can't wait. Let me pray for us. Father, give us expectant hearts to look forward to the fulfillment of these words. Thank you for this grand unveiling of truth. I love how John says it in the end of that verse. He says, these are the true words of God. Lord, there's so much in our world that's uncertain. We, we don't know if we can trust our news many days, and we don't know what we can trust. But we can trust your word. It's never led us astray. It holds true. And the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word stands forever. Thank you, Lord, for your infallible true word. Bless us to trust in it and to live by it. And again, may its principles sink into us that we would live differently. And that we would call all that we meet into this grand reunion and feast coming. This grand supper. Jesus, bless us to yield to you. May we never deny you by your mercy and grace in us. Lord, when we face our days of testing, may we hold true by your grace and mercy. And may we stand for you. You stood for us and died for us. May we live for you no matter the cost. I pray for anyone in this room that's not received you, Lord, that you would work in their hearts to receive you. If there's anyone in this room playing games with you that's far from you, that may miss that meal, work in their hearts. Holy Spirit, draw them into their need for Christ that they may be saved. And that, Father, no one will miss that, that meal by your grace. And no one in this room will miss it. Bless us along and help us to grow together in this grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. We're going to have our closing hymn of commitment to these words. And if you're here today and if you need prayer, I'll be up front. Pastor Mike Adams will be up front. We're ready to pray with you for any need. If you need to become a Christian, if you, if you just have a burden you just want to have us pray for, we're here for you.